What's happening, friends? Welcome to episode 383, a palindromatic episode of Unlocked, IGN's weekly Xbox show. Uh, coming up on this week's episode, one of the biggest stories of the Xbox year for sure. I know it's only February, but my goodness, Xbox Game Pass may be on the way to Nintendo Switch. Yes, you heard that right. Plus, uh, I sat down with Bonnie Ross in Las Vegas as she was inducted into the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences Hall of Fame. Uh, did an unfiltered interview. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little piece of that that we ran on IGN. It pertains to Halo 4 and a developer besides 343 that was considered to make it at one point. Plus, HoloLens 2 is out. Not Xbox-specific, uh, but we've got some Xbox experiences we can tie into it. We'll talk about Microsoft's new piece of technology. I'm Brian McCaffrey. To my left, Brandon Tyrell. Hello. Miranda Sanchez. Hello. Uh, we're all recovering from yeah. getting there. From, uh, being the walking wounded last week. One day at a time. Almost not congested. Almost. Yeah. Getting you, can, there. you can hear it in Miranda and my voice. Uh, we're still working our way back. To my right, however, longtime unlocked favorite, Sean the Shark Finnegan. Chomp, chomp. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. Well, unfortunately, uh, it's not the happiest of reasons. I mean, it is, but it is, it is for us. It's You're happy. You're moving on to an awesome new thing. This is going to be your last appearance on Unlocked. Yeah, my final Unlocked appearance. Uh, a while ago, it's been some time, I kind of used to be a regular player, maybe like sixth man off the bench kind of player for Unlocked, which was great because, I don't know, I owe you a lot for having me on, but I've been a huge Xbox fan for some time, big Halo player player, obviously. And, uh, you know, I really enjoyed uh, coming on the show and talking with you guys because you're all extraordinarily knowledgeable experts about uh, Xbox and the brand and Microsoft and everything games. So I really enjoyed sitting at this table. So to come back and have one more opportunity to do that before I go off on a new adventure, it's I'm really honored. So I wanted to thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a pleasure. You've we've talked so much Halo over the years. Yeah, we have. Yeah. <laughs> Shared a lot of great Halo experiences. You're I think our you're the you're IGN's best Halo player. Thank you. So I we're, we're suffering thing. on the way out here <laughs> in that department. No, I mean, I, I played a lot of Halo over the years. I've been playing it since, you know, 2001. So uh, I'm pretty experienced in it, but uh, I'm a very particular type of Halo player. I would say Miranda's probably just as oh, good, if thanks. not better than me in many respects of the game. But thank you. I love playing the game, and we've had some great experiences doing that, and... Hopefully we will continue to. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Thankfully, there's a thing called Xbox Live yes, that exists. Exactly, and we can still play Halo together. So yeah, I mean, your your new employer is getting uh, a heck of a Halo player. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting an even better person. It's it's just been so awesome working with you. I wish you the best. That's so sweet. Thanks, Ryan. Honestly, like being part of IGN and the people who like the people who work here are amazing. That's been the best part for me, and that's the hardest thing for me to leave behind. Um, you know, Ryan, I've always thought that you were like the goat in terms of games media. Like you, the oh, your composure, it. your stop poise, all of the stuff you've done Keep over going. the years. <laughs> <laughs> it's been really amazing, and we've worked in some incredibly tense and like difficult situations at times, games comms and what's not. And you're always very composed. You've always done your homework, and it's amazing. Well, you shot. Um, the greatest thing I will ever do in my career, certainly at IGN, you shot Unlock 201 with with uh, with Seamus Blackley and Phil Spencer and Peter Moore. Yeah, that episode is one of the most memorable things I've done in all of my career, not just my career at IGN, uh, but having those three guys telling stories about this brand that we love and sharing sort of behind the scenes like anecdotes for how they did particular things. Yeah. It's really quite amazing. Again, I can't say it enough. If you haven't watched that episode. You could feel it in the room. Oh, I know I, yeah. I could sitting there at the host like I knew like twenty minutes in, I was like, this is this is like the <laughs> it best was thing I'm ever gonna so do. Yeah, like, gold. We it was crazy. We did it at E three and I'm at sitting night. there yeah at after night hours. way after hours. It was just you, me, like maybe Dave and then the Xbox guys. There was PR PR Xbox PR team was there. Yeah, like but I looked around while this was happening. I was like, this isn't live or on prime time. This is like some of the best content we've ever made. Like, how is this happening? Like, in the middle of the night, like behind closed doors. Like, it was crazy. But uh, I guess it had to be that way. But yeah, there's seriously, I've been here seven years and there's been countless experiences like that. A lot of them are with you guys. And, you know, I just can't thank you all enough. And, you know, Sometimes it's hard to remember sitting in a room like this when you're just talking amongst friends and colleagues that this is a podcast and it's a community, but the Unlocked community, uh, I want to thank you guys too for your positive response to me being on the show. I'm just honored to be able to come on and share my opinions with you guys and talk and you know have fun. 
Well, I look forward to hearing about your your next adventure. Mm -hmm. I will be revealing that very soon, so you can follow me on Twitter at Shot by Finnegan. I obviously can't talk too much about it just yet, but trust that I won't be going too far. I'll still be in games. I'll still be creating content, and there will be a number of different ways that you can still engage with me and uh, hear my opinions and perspectives on games and movies and whatnot going forward. Love it. All right. Uh, let's get started here with one of the most truly unbelievable things I've read mm -hmm. this year, but it is... Uh, backed up by a couple of credi credible sources, so yeah. I'm going to throw this out to you guys. The uh, Xbox Game Pass and Microsoft's it, it effort to get games on anywhere you want to play them, well, they weren't kidding about that, because uh, Direct Feed Games via Game Informer, and they're, both, both those uh, outlets and their sources claim that Microsoft is preparing to publish ports of some of its games, uh, including Ori and the Blind Forest, on the Switch alongside uh, Switch owners uh, streaming Game Pass titles via Project X Cloud. Uh, GI sources say the announcement could happen as soon as this year, so maybe they'll drop that bomb at E3, maybe they'll save it for next year when they're laying out their whole next-gen initiative. Uh, so, you know, can't say with 100% certainty that this is happening, but it looks very likely, and I did not believe this when if, I first read it. If this actually happens... I'm already very disappointed in Scott Lee because this would have been such a great E3 announcement. Right. Like, what if someone just from Nintendo comes out on the Microsoft and you're like, wait, excuse me, what is happening? Mm -hmm. And they revealed this. That is nuts. Like, I, I just... Seeing them work together is so cool because, like, obviously it's good for it to have competition, but it's also great to be able to just experience things you love in other places as well um, and bridge that gap in various ways. And... Games Pass is just like one of my favorite things Microsoft has done in a very long time. And seeing that potentially coming to Switch and getting more people on all these games and of course getting this really great subscription that gives you access to fantastic games is just awesome. I mean, being able to take some yeah. of that and stuff getting to play portably yeah. wherever you are. I mean, I guess... It effectively there, gives Microsoft a handheld console. Yeah. I yeah, mean, which people have been asking for for years, you know, Will you need? Presumably, you'd have to be connected, mm -hmm. so you couldn't necessarily be sitting there playing yeah. Ori on a plane without, you know, especially with the crappy like go go internet. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I'm thinking too. Is but my, my switch comes out at airports. Yeah, but I think it's really cool. I mean, Microsoft has really nothing to lose at, with this venture. <clears> like it, it, they're pushing Game Pass hard, and that subscription service <laughs> is sustaining them. Um, I think just opening up the Nintendo's uh, audience to to Microsoft's subscription service, which is already one of the best deals in the gaming world, uh, is, is nothing but smart, you know? I just can't, I mean, think about all the times that you've wanted to play a game like Ori on the go or on handheld, or mm -hmm. like for games like uh, Limbo, I bought them on multiple consoles because it's a great experience that I love to play like in chunks or for smaller periods of time, which is something I use the Switch for. Right. It's like a such a natural fit. Mm -hmm. um, and like Miranda said and Brandon said, like increasing the subscriber base, Microsoft being able to make their games more accessible to a larger audience not only benefits them because it's better awareness for their brand, but like gamers get to experience games that maybe they didn't get to because Xbox didn't penetrate the market as well as maybe Mm -hmm. PlayStation or obviously switched it. And the reality is not everyone can have every console. Like I feel very fortunate that I have always been able to do that. Um, but that would be super exciting to hear someone who's like, yeah, I just bought the Switch because I think this is the best fit for me. And then suddenly they have access to all these really great games that they didn't have before. And especially like good price, good deals. Um, my concern, as we were talking about before the show, was like connectivity. Yeah. Um, I know mm -hmm. even just playing the Switch at home, like undocked, sometimes the connectivity issues are definitely there. And so I kind of worry that if this is a streaming service and you're streaming your video games, like what is that going to yeah. look like? How are these games actually going to look when they're on handheld on Switch, which is resolution is different. Um, but I think those are things that you accept and acknowledge when you sign up for this, right? When the Switch is, it's a, it's a 720p yeah. right. screen. Yeah. So that sort of plays to a streaming service's benefit in this case. For sure. But like, I wonder how does that translate to sort of the games that are available on Game Pass, right? Like something like Ori or like Finnegan said, Limbo or Inside. But those make a lot of sense. Those make a lot of sense. Yeah, and like, well, and Limbo and Inside are already on Switch well, natively. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> I know what you're coming uh, from. But the opportunity to play Ori 2 when it comes out on your Switch would be fantastic. Um, but 
like Finnegan also said before the show, what is Halo Five going to look like, right? About what is gears, what yeah, is yeah, gears going to look like? <laughs> yeah. Not not just from a uh, sort of resolution or technical standpoint, but also readability. Like that game was not designed to be played on screens, on a tiny screen. Yeah, the screens are big enough. I would say. I yeah. mean, I, I have had a lot of really great experiences on Switch, and I think a lot of the games that they have that are meant to be, you know, played docked are still great handheld experiences. Mm -hmm. But in like, of course, shorter burst, which is also a limitation of the um, battery life, which is another concern. Like, if you're constantly streaming True. something, how long is that actually going to last? True. Um, I mean, there's like a lot of technical questions here yeah. that definitely come into play, but um, that's not for me to figure out. Just a yeah. question. So <laughs> yeah, and we're looking at this from a mostly a handheld perspective. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but remembering when you have your switch docked and hooked up to your TV, you essentially are just streaming in an Xbox One <laughs> at that point. So that's another big question, though. Like, what do you do about controllers? Because mm. there's Pro like the Joy-Con yeah. is a very different experience. Yeah. Well, obviously, you got to play one Joy-Con on <laughs> Gears. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah you, you split them in half. Like here you guys go. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and you got to imagine that Microsoft wants to get games like Halo 5 and Gears into more players' hands, so those are the types of games that they would love, that would benefit from the service like this. But mm -hmm. like Miranda said, the technical limitations and aspects of it do pose some questions. Like, But it's possible, which is cool. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I was going to talk about that a little bit. There's a service out there that, like, you know, on the video side of things, we're always looking at different ways to accomplish our goals in terms of video capture and gameplay capture, right? So we researched this streaming service that exists now called Shadow, it's developed by a French company, but it launched here in California last year, I think, um, that allows you to do effectively the same thing, which is stream video games over a Wi-Fi connection from a remote PC onto any sort of PC machine-like device, right? So Marco Blanca, a former producer here, was playing on a MacBook Pro, like an old MacBook Pro Anthem, which he was streaming via Shadow. And it was a little laggy, but the quality and the fidelity of the game actually looked as if it were being rendered and played on a PC, mm -hmm. which is pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, we speculated that with like a proper internet connection or like a private one like you might have in your home, that it might actually run moderately well. And to be able to get a game like Anthem and stream it anywhere on your device, like the technology is pretty incredible, even if it's a little wonky. So one would hope that Microsoft coming into it with their large infrastructure and very technical uh skill set might be able to develop tools where, you know, these logistics that we have concerns about don't play a factor. Yeah. It would be really cool if it wasn't laggy or if there was no input delay or any of those things. Yeah, I mean, this, this is Microsoft absolutely putting their money where their mouth is yeah. with regard to I mean, xCloud and, and this idea that they've been pushing for the last year or so of gaming anywhere. They're the company that can do it. Like, they have the infrastructure. Yeah. And it's not the first time, I think. Anytime I hear about streaming services, I always hear it with a little trepidation, yeah, right? Me too. Because you you remember like NVIDIA and it's Shield streaming and- right. um, well, I'm I just also an old school gamer. Like I still use wired mice and wired ethernet connections and wired headset, wired yeah. computer, like keyboard. Cause like, I just don't- You don't want the latency. Yeah, I don't want I don't <laughs> want anything to potentially interrupt my gaming. I'm like too old school and hard Gotta to win those one-on-ones. -on -ones, yeah, so you know? like just, you're like, oh, well you can stream Halo 5 onto your phone or something nah. via the internet. I'm like, <laughs> can you though? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, I have hope because this could be awesome. Yeah. And I think for a lot of us who do have both consoles and if you already have Game Pass, I think it's just awesome to be able to say, well, I have this and I really am sick and I just want to lay in bed and play my game. But now I can just grab my Switch and play it there. Yeah. And that would be cool. If, you know, the benefit for Nintendo is obvious, which yes. is they yes. just get, they it's get, uh, their catalog goes way up. It's 120 plus something games right now that yeah, you game instantly Pass. have a new library. Yeah. Right. So it's huge for them. And for Microsoft, you know, what's interesting to me, I, I may I may have said this last week, I don't remember, but uh, so while I was at DICE, I talked to a, a prominent game developer uh, who was kind of that, yeah, he didn't hear it from me kind of thing, but I was mm. talking to this person about Game Pass, and they were saying, yeah, like it, at a small scale, Game Pass just <laughs> makes no sense for a, for a developer, particularly a smaller developer. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just, you're... Effectively giving your game away. Effectively, yeah. yeah. But at scale, mm -hmm. when it when it does scale up, it suddenly flips and becomes a win for you because you'd get so many more eyes on your game because it's effectively free as part of the service that you just people that would have never you'd you'd have never been able to get their attention right before because of you know for a million different reasons. So. Yeah, the 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 more Microsofts uh, can scale it, and that's if, if they're bringing in Switch subscribers, that's a heck of a way to you know that's 
another what how many tens of millions of players you could potentially exactly. be bringing in i mean that's that would that would radically help the goal of <clears throat> of scaling game and your pass. your metric for success becomes subscribers which is yeah. always what it is for a subscription service right it's the same thing with netflix right like just going to say that netflix can burn so much money developing content because they're not looking to how many people viewed that content or how many dollars were made from that particular piece of content it's right. did that drive more viewership to the service like how many more subscribers did we get right. everyone is paying at least 8 bucks a month yeah. right so you know you have a floor as far as uh, revenue goes, uh, you can burn however much money you are, and you know consistently every month, assuming subscribers don't fluctuate too much, you're going to be pulling in that amount of cash. So it's really easy to project at that point, right? Yeah. It also kind of nullifies the whole, like, you know, you want a AAA game like a Gears or a Halo to sell lots of copies on its release, right? But for a smaller game like Cuphead or something, where maybe the price point itself already would have been lower if it were sold individually, now it has an even playing field where both a game like Halo and Cuphead are generating the same sort of value for the company mm. through the subscription service because now it's not about sales, right? It's about whether they subbed, which is awesome. And like Ryan said, there's so many switches out in the world. Like, that's just a totally untapped market. Like, it's honestly like a no brainer. Like, this Everyone is a great in my idea. My family has a Switch. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. At this point, that's we, what's, we all bought one. <laughs> that's what's crazy to me is it reminds me actually a lot of. Uh, the Wii, right, back in the day, where everyone had either an Xbox or they had a PlayStation. Like, the the sort of the core gamer demographic uh, had one of the two major consoles, and then everyone had a Wii as well. Mm -hmm. So if the Wii is the number two console for everyone, it's the number one console, mm -hmm. uh, which seems... Like it seems to mirror what's happening right now. Where remember, remember Peter Moore, the Wii sixty. Like everybody have a have a Wii and a three sixty. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or if you didn't have a three sixty, you had a PlayStation, but you also had a Wii. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, it seems to be mirroring what's happening right now, where you have a Xbox One or you have a, a PS Four, but then you also have a Switch. And Microsoft is so smart by trying to at least embed themselves a little bit in that you know that secondary. Uh, uh, you know, that secondary console demographic. Yep, especially with next gen coming around the corner. It's mm. like, oh, you like this? Maybe check out our new console that's coming out and they'll give you exactly. a very different experience. Exactly. You can get the 4K streaming. Yep. You can do all these other great things and I'm sure they will promise with it. And it's just a good, good link. It's really smart. If you like what's on Game Pass, if you like the exclusives, if you like the third party stuff that you wouldn't have access to otherwise if you only own a Switch, now you're thinking next generation, hey, there's a budget Xbox coming out. That's not a bad idea. I could probably afford that. Right. It's very smart. Yeah, I, I tell you, I would have loved to have been the fly on the wall when I presume Microsoft initiates the call. Yeah. And, and, and then they have an in-person meeting in a well, bunker underground. They're, they're <laughs> right down the street from each other, both in Redmond, Washington, mm -hmm. yep. the suburb of Seattle. They're they're close by. They're neighbors. So I wonder if that's a Phil calls Reggie kind of thing. I mean, because it's it it's it certainly I'm sure doesn't start at that level, but it Definitely makes it up to that level. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I uh, if Phil ever comes back in here, I want to ask him about that. So we we'll have to wait for this to be officially announced before he's going to yeah, talk about it. But what the logistics are, like I'm sure there's going to be some sort of limitations on what games are available through yeah. it. Yeah. But, um, I'm curious. It becomes yeah. it becomes decidedly less lucrative if you have to optimize any of your games on Game Pass for the Switch. So I'm curious what sort of like heavy lifting needs to be done ahead right. of time. Um, but Lots I'm I'm very curious to learn more yeah. about this. Yeah, uh, and I, I imagine mean, I, we'll hear about it at E3, if not before. I agree with you. I was that was going to be the point I wanted to end on because it's if if the cat is kind of out of the bag here, I doubt they'll sit on this for a year and almost a half. Mm -hmm. It'll probably they'll talk about it at E3 whether they originally intended to or not. It's the kind of announcement that would bring the house down. Like to Miranda's point, I was. Were you guys at the E3 conference where they announced backwards compatibility? Yeah. Yeah, that brought the house down. <laughs> and this is a similar announcement. It's like something that not any, like I don't think a lot of people were expecting, uh, like backwards compatibility that just everyone, when they hear it, wants so bad because it would be awesome. Now the real question, do you think Nintendo games report over to the no, Xbox? I don't think it's going to go the other way. At least Are we going to get Gen 8 Pokemon on the <laughs> Xbox One? I would die. My yeah. Charizard looks so good on the X. I also <laughs> never never see that happening. Yeah, no, no either. Yeah, but no, no, no Breath of the Wild on uh Oh, Xbox, my God. Probably. How cool would that be? That would be awesome. <laughs> so weird. But uh, we'll take it. We'll take what we can get, nevertheless. Yeah. All Dare right. to dream. Uh, next up this week, again, as I mentioned earlier in the show, I had a chance to sit down with Bonnie Ross in Las Vegas at the DICE conference uh, was at a week or two ago. 
And yeah, Bonnie is just an inducted into the AIAS Hall of Fame, uh, just celebrating her whole career. And I was uh, finally able to pin her down and sit, and sit her down to, to talk about her career on Unfiltered. And uh, so that full episode's out now. I highly encourage you to watch it. We talk, definitely, obviously, it's about her career. And she started on, a, on an NBA game for Microsoft for PC. That was the first game she worked on. Wow. So uh, we go from there and, and just sort of her background. But it's certainly we come around to 343. And yes, we, we talk about Master Chief Collection and, and the, the issues there uh, and Halo 5 and the, the, what happened with the single player campaign there. And, uh, and then, of course, Infinite. We definitely talk Infinite. She had a really interesting comment uh, about um, the Slipspace engine and mm-hmm. sort of the reason why they built it. So I really highly encourage you to watch it. But um, a, a segment we put up yesterday, sort of as a teaser, which I, th- I thought was worth discussion here, is uh, with regard to Halo 4. So Bonnie asked Shane Kim after the Bungie split with Microsoft, hey, I think we should do something with this. Let's, let me create a studio. I want to run with this. I want to I wanna take care of it. But before that, when they were... The Bungie divorce was happening, and Microsoft said, okay, well, all right, what do we do with Halo now? We're losing Bungie. All right, well, maybe we should just make one more. Uh, and so before 343 existed, they they uh, had a short list that apparently never got past one developer. They were considering having Gearbox make Halo 4. It's insane to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that like blows my mind yeah. anyway. That was like Gearbox had made the PC version <clears throat> of Halo One, mm-hmm. right? So there was there was a relationship yeah. there, and they did a very good job on that, by the way. They did, yeah. Actually, uh, I know a lot of people who like rank some of those PC exclusive maps as some of their like their yeah. maps. They're really good, yeah. Um, Infinity. So at this point, though, Gearbox would have not made Borderlands Two, but did make Borderlands One, right? That's yes. where they were well, at yeah. the timeline. The, it would I have mean, already been made. Yeah. Yeah. I guess. Yeah, Borderlands One was probably so far in that they would have finished it, but but this that was could like have oh seven or something, right? Oh eight, a little farther than that. But um, mm-hmm. Borderlands Sorry. Two yeah. came out and Borderlands Two came out actually right before Halo Four did, mm-hmm. same year two thousand twelve. So this would have either replaced or or just moved the timeline on Borderlands Two. Wow, it was and five it years happened. between Halo Three and Four. Yeah, because Halo uh, 3 was 07. ODST so yeah. and Reach were in there. That's right. To fill the gaps. That's right. That's why it doesn't seem so long, because yeah. we had a lot more Halo. Yes. Yeah. Um, the first Borderlands was in 2009, and this oh, one nine. was in 2012. Okay. okay, so not that far off for me. Yeah, this is interesting, because just like the way uh, we think of Gearbox now, based on their pedigree and what they did with Borderlands, is such a different kind of shooter than what Halo is, right? <laughs> um, Borderlands, a little bit more, I mean way more RPG heavy, like a lot more looter shooter, like f- focused on collecting all sorts of different weapons and armor, uh, a, lo- a la like a Destiny, uh, or a lot of other games, I guess, these days. But back then, like that wasn't really, a lot of people weren't doing that, right? So mm. to think that Halo might have been something more like that, that's well, I don't think that's crazy necessarily I don't, true. Yeah. No, 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 but I mean like, yeah, and who's to say what Gearbox would have done with it, right? Yeah. But like, you think of Gearbox one way now, and I have to imagine on some level, like, if a studio like that makes a pitch for that, or they are looking for that, they're going to want to do something that's... Something bold. That yeah. they do, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, because the Gearbox spin on it. It's yeah. worth remembering, uh, in addition to Halo 1 for PC, with those extra multiplayer maps that were, that were very good, uh, Gearbox got its start by working with Valve on mm-hmm. two, the the two official Half Life expansion packs, mm-hmm. Opposing Force and Blue Shift, which were really good, mm-hmm. they were cool interpretations of the Half Life universe from a from a different perspective. <laughs> so they've they've Gearbox has played in other in the playground of other IPs before, mm. but yeah, I agree. Like I, it's it would have been very interesting to see what Gearbox's take mm-hmm. on on Halo would have been. You know, as a post Halo Three game, yeah. you know, picking up where that left off, I'd be more curious about the story wise because you know Halo has a Bible, right? Yeah, Microsoft has a Halo Bible. It's a, these are the core pillars. This is what we hit. These are the design uh, tenets that we have to adhere to. Um, but as far as that story goes, like 
I really, really enjoyed the Halo 4 story because I spent a lot of time reading the terminals in Halo 3. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the conversations between the librarian and Didact and Mendicant Bias and Gravemind. And those, those were really interesting lore building pieces for me. And then to see Halo 4 touch on quite a bit of that was something that I never really knew I wanted more of until, until it was right there. Yep. Um, but I'm curious, like, is that the story that's told if Gearbox develops it, right? Yeah, I mean, that's a really down? that's a really interesting. I mean, just be, it's so hard to say, right? It's all speculation, yeah, right? Sure, but like, yeah. really know. part yeah. of me want part of me thinks if I was running a studio that's known for doing something really well, that I would want to bring some element of that to mm -hmm. Halo to make it our interpretation of Halo, right? Mm -hmm. But like you said, you got to work with Microsoft. They own the IP. They've <laughs> made it into a huge, mega, worldwide, world-renowned franchise. So you can't change too much, or else right. it ceases to be a Halo game. I mean, so that balance is really interesting. Yeah, I mean that's the thing is like when I think of Xbox, I think of Master Chief. Yeah. Like, and I don't think you can really mess with that formula too much just because like if this is like their their flagship thing, like they're not going to, even if it is like the continuation of the story, even if it's just one more game with Master Chief, right. they wouldn't, I think, have let them go too far with changing it um, without every single blessing checked off kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Like there's there's just too much there, too much like weight on Master Chief for them to, I think, experiment too much. Um so ultimately, I think they probably would have trusted your boss because of like their experience with the PC port and saying like, "Hey, these guys know our style. They know what Halo is. You know, I, I guess Bungie style and like what what they were looking for there." So I don't think they would have been cool with them deviating too much. Yeah, yeah. Also, I don't know. Part of me thinks that maybe that Halo Four campaign story might be a little less. Uh like for lack of a better word, serious just because of mm. what Gearbox's sense That's of true. humor is like and how kind of like they're tonally they're willing to be able to play with characters and have them be a little light and poke like their fun a maybe little bit. Maybe the cheekiness a little bit more. Yeah, well, like I maybe a little bit. How much of that is the just the Borderlands series though? Well, because I mean, Aliens, Aliens didn't really have that tongue-in-cheek sort of and, and that was the other one I wanted to bring up was <laughs> just because like that, no, that game, uh, I didn't review that one. No, I know. I, I probably would have given it a lower score than we even we even gave it. I, re uh, I remember what the, do we give the, the backlash. Like the 360, the console versions yeah. of Aliens Colonial Marines were three, a what are noticeable step down from the not good PC version. Like yeah. they were oh, man. it was not a pretty picture. But I just I remember a side by side gif of the uh Oh, the vertical slice. I mean, the, vert was, the vertical yeah. slice that they showed it, uh, maybe it was an E3 or something, I don't really remember, but they showed the alien like skulking through and being right. just super being terrifying. Alien -y. And then smash cut to it from the game. It's like, <laughs> it looked I mean, like a little T Rex. That's, that's getting a bit off course. I know, but yeah. I know. The point I wanted to make with that was that game maybe would have never existed because almost certainly, uh, you know, Gearbox had multiple teams, right? Uh, as far as I know, still does, but uh, back then they did. But um, so G Borderlands 2 would have probably still happened maybe by the other team or right. maybe it gets pushed back and maybe everybody goes all in on Halo because that would have been a, a big production. But yeah, that that may have erased Al Aliens Colonial Marines from existence. I imagine it almost certainly would have. Yeah, because just given the timing. Just given the timing, yeah. I mean, had they started pre-production on Borderlands 2 when the ink dried on this Halo deal, uh, you can imagine you would have had a team working on each one, right? Yeah. But it's really hard as a studio, uh, I think, to get, like, pen a deal like this and not become the new Halo studio, you know? Like, that's what you do now. You make Halo. We are the Halo guys. Like, it's hard not to fall into that trap, and I know... Uh, maybe it's not even a trap. I'm sure there's a, a certain amount of pride to it. Of like, course. Oh, of course. To be had saying like, you know what? We've picked up the mantle, no pun intended, of, of Halo. And uh, now that's who we are. That's our identity. Um, would that mean that aliens didn't exist? I think so. But also means... Battleborn wouldn't have existed, and hmm. you know every every other like new butterfly IP, effect, new IP that they would have tried. Uh, for all we know, Gearbox could still be making the Halo series now, right? Well, from if you watch the interview, but Bonnie seemed to imply that it might have just been a one, one or two games, and that's and that yeah, they yeah. not not like a long term thing, just like a contract, like Microsoft. Hey, we want to wrap this up, and we're gonna let it go. We're gonna just let it be. But let's do one more game and, and bring oh. somebody in to do uh -huh. it. I see. But so you never like, know. Like you, it, yeah, but I mean, like, what if it's a hit, right? Exactly. Then you're like, well, oh, so this, another one. This was sort of like the ending of Halo 3 being ambiguous. They wanted to really put a punctuation mark at the end of it. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. Rather than start a new series. But like Finnegan said, like anything you that never makes, know. Anything that makes money 
chances are real good that you're going to yeah. get a sequel. Now, right? the thing I wanted to come back to something you started to touch on, Sean, which is we're talking about all right, what would Gearbox have done? What would their interpretation be? What about multiplayer? Halo oh. now, Halo Four multiplayer is. Not that it's bad at all, but it's regarded as a, a little bit of a misstep relative to the rest of the series, whereas the single player was super strong. Um, so, yeah, w what would Gearbox's take on multiplayer have been? Because that would have certainly been a, a different, whole different animal. It's hard to imagine without thinking about it in terms of Borderlands, you know, like what the multiplayer is like in that. So... I don't know, part of me thinks that Halo would still be in it in some way, shape, or form like an arena shooter, although four and by three four three ended no. up not being so much of that. But like with Borderlands specifically, like the drop in, drop out sort of multiplayer uh concept, maybe that would have made it in there. I don't know. The possibilities are endless. Like it's actually very cool to speculate about that. I'm just captivated by no, we're always like, Valhalla. Wait, what if we go play uh, Halo? <laughs> yeah, what if we stop talking right now? I actually miss this map me so too. much. It's yeah. yeah. I am not a big Mantis fan. I'm going to just yeah, they edited divert for a quick second and say, I was, I, I've just never really... I would say it's really awesome it. in Warzone and straight yeah. up. That like, I don't doubt. Yeah. yeah, I was never a big Warzone player. Oh my gosh. Like so Warzone. for a long time after, I mean, so I played a lot of competitive Slayer in, uh, you know, in Halo 5. Like I put, I don't know, maybe 2,000 hours into Halo 5. Um, but towards the end there, once like you wanted something a little less tryhardy, <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so great to jump into Warzone because you get this amazing, Halo has the best sandbox I'm convinced of any first-person shooter. I'm with you. The weapons, the grenades, the vehicles, they all feel so good. And then in Warzone, you get all this extra variations of it. Like, there's a Covenant Warthog in War in Warzone. It's awesome. It shoots needles. It's got, like, a plasma shield. It's awesome. Uh, but, like, I don't know. I can I can imagine Gearbox doing something, like, way out of left field with the multiplayer and it not being an arena shooter. Uh, if they were to take Thanks. on four, I had so many battle rifle one on ones on that section. Yeah, it's like of the I know map. that that little area. I know those engagements. I remember what I did there. If you're watching the video, we're watching multiplayer yeah, sorry, guys. of we're, Halo right now. We're so gone now. We're all kind this of. This has been taken completely off track. This is why we can't do video anymore. We'll talk about that later. Going down memory <laughs> yeah. lane. Um, but yeah, boy, the, the the and you know how much of their multi of Gearbox's multiplayer take would have been influenced by whatever their single player take on it right. was because they certainly. They generally need to, to tie together in, in some way, even if just tonally. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it could have been uh, that. That's that's definitely a, an interesting what if. Mm -hmm. What if there if Microsoft had decided not to form three four three industries and simply go with one more Halo to wrap things up? Surely we've done a feature like that, right? Like the what ifs of all gaming history, because that'd be an interesting read. We probably should if we haven't already, but um, giving you guys gold here in the last yeah, like, your, couple weeks. Thanks. Yeah. Very well. <laughs> Research intensive features. <laughs> That's true. Very true. But uh, yeah, please check out that episode of Unfiltered. It's on podcast services. I encourage you to, but you can watch it on IGN or watch it on YouTube as well. Um, but yeah, however you want to watch it, listen to it. It was a great conversation with Bonnie Ross. Uh, apologies for the beige hotel room that we shot in. <laughs> it was the, It was literally the best we could do. We tried so hard to get like an awesome shooting location but because you, you those did hotels are not really it, it was if we'd have done a conference room those are those, those are, are white worse. and bland yeah. yeah those are worse so hope you like fluorescent lights that's why i shoot <laughs> that's why i had need developers to come here so i can shoot yeah. it in a nice studio where we can customize the bag and for context you did that at dice in, yeah that was in vegas in at vegas. the aria hotel uh ah, the aria yes all right finally this week i want to talk about something that's not exactly Xbox specific but it's it's in the Xbox verse it's in the Microsoft verse HoloLens has returned in the form of HoloLens 2 a new hardware revision of Microsoft's augmented reality technology um I'd say I was not expecting this anytime soon because it seemed like you know they still haven't really gone consumer facing with it it's been no. all kind of developers and Super expensive dev kits. For years. For a while. Yeah, I mean, that was a good three, four years ago. Yeah. Yeah, it seems they, like they're just using it in other industries. Like, it's not really meant to be a consumer, like, video game toy. Right. They're thing. looking at right. it for military applications, like medical, medical versus, applications. Yeah. yeah. Engineering. Uh, edu educational. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's there's some definitely intriguing potential to it. But, uh, yeah, so HoloLens, too, it's, you know, it's obviously, as you'd expect, the, the, the guts of it are a lot better. 
Um, the thing I wanted to talk about was, which was sort of two things. Well, one, it's their big tangible selling point to it is that it, the viewing angle is twice as big as it used to be. Now, it, it was fairly narrow. Did who did I know you? Did you get to do the Halo experience at E3? No, I no, did. Marit, I, Marit, I did. I did like just, I you and I did. Sean. I did. Yeah, I did the yeah. Google Earth thing. Um, like three or four years ago at a okay. GBC where you're basically un- overlooking Google Earth's uh, 3D sort of topographical map and you yeah. like kind of move through the city. And, right. Yeah. So at E3, I believe it, I want to say it was 2015. Don't quote me on that. Um, but Sean, there was, in Microsoft's booth, they had a Halo experience set up. And it was, it was a HoloLens experience and it was, there was a physical space modeled after the, uh, a Pelican dropship. So you'd go in there, you'd gear up, and then you'd get uh, you'd you'd walk after you got your gear, which was the Hololens. It's like a, a basically like a backpack at that point for mm-hmm. the 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 computing. It was basically you wore a computer on your back mm-hmm. and then had the helmet, the Hololens visor, uh, and then you'd walk down the hall to the briefing room, which was like this kind of round table, and you know it had a holographic image in the middle. That was really super cool, was it not? It was, man. Like it's tough to describe without really going into a lot of detail because it's you know kind of new tech. But yeah, like essentially on the in within this helmet, there's like a small square. Uh, we were talking about the narrow field of view in which the augmented reality could be projected. Yeah, it's so about right. it was about the size, and that was the big downside to it. Was it was amazing tech, but it was a, the viewing angle was basically like a mail slot. Yeah, yeah, like think of your computer monitor if you were standing. 15 feet away from it yeah. or like mm-hmm. 10 feet away from it. It's that small. It's like a, it's like it's a like, small square about this far away yeah. from you uh, in this helmet. And But what's really cool is when you're looking through that square, what uh, w- on the other side of it was a totally transformed space based on the real world one that you were in. Yes. So you were walking through this pelican and to your left there'd be like fake windows of the pelican, right? And if you looked through the square in your headset out the windows, you would see wide open landscapes of all these pelicans and ships and military stuff. Like it was looking like into a different world out there. And it was actually very, very cool. I spent a lot of time just walking through it, wondering like, so someone designed that that is there. Like if I look out this window, that's there. But how does it know I'm standing right here? Like I am not connected to anything. Like I'm wearing this headset. So how how it does, does it what it does. And stuff? Yeah, like yeah. surely they must have mapped the space and been like, if you're standing here and you look through this window, this is what yeah. you'll see. But how does it know you're standing there? And <laughs> like, uh, the man. I, yeah, it's crazy. I right? was completely transfixed. But the simplest thing, but you know, in in all the halos, going back to Halo One, you have your diamond, blue diamond waypoint. Mm-hmm. Well, when it tells you to go down the hallway yeah. to go and then turn right to go to the mission briefing with the round table, which we'll talk about in a second, you got on, you got hologram, you know, it, in your field of view, a blue diamond waypoint. Yeah. And the number, you know, the, the distance oh. would, would count like it was That's accurate so cool. as you walked toward it. Yeah. So it was literally like being Master Chief for two seconds. Yeah. And again, those are things where I'm like, how does it know? Like, I tested that. I walked forward and then the number got smaller. And then I walked backwards and it got bigger. And I was like, what is this? is crazy. <laughs> yeah. It was very, very cool. And very ima- surreal. Imagine the cool applications of that. Like, it's just in the real world. Well, that's kind of because like as a kid, you put on sunglasses and you see a waypoint like on the way home and you walk home from school. Oh, my Aww. God. Yeah. Yeah. Cute. It's sweet. Yeah, like there's so many cool potential applications for this. Like obviously when people are talking about military applications and medical, like I can obviously see the benefits there, right? Like if you could teach doctors how to do surgery without actually cutting open bodies, like that would be really cool, right? Um, yeah. Similarly, things that are very technical, like uh, we already we saw in this trailer someone like working on what appeared to be like a car engine, yeah. having directions appear over the different components. Right. Like, or, or you can get like an exploded view of an engine to right. look inside to see where things connect and... Yeah, and like when we saw when we saw the demo of Hololens for the first time at E3, like the way they displayed it on stage with the Minecraft demo, yes, like mm-hmm. just the the way it allows people to get into sort of creative spaces and learn in a hands-on style. It just the possibilities seem limitless with something like that. Yeah, and I I wonder if that was sort of a misstep, like using valuable conference time to promote Hololens, though. That technology and Minecraft. Is, that technology is very yeah. cool. They but just bought Minecraft. That also, yeah. That but yeah. yeah, but essentially, you're trying to. It almost feels like you were. Granted, I don't know 
the mindset they were in. But it almost feels like they were trying to shoehorn this cool technology into the gaming space when it's never really delivered there, right? Because we all remember that commercial where the kid is sitting on the couch and he yep. looks at his coffee table and suddenly Minecraft appears and he's yeah. like breaking blocks and moving stuff. That that's that's not really a reality to yeah. to the regard that they showed it. Yeah. Um, whereas the technology seems very cool in non gaming related spaces. Uh, you know, like you said, military, medical, engineering, tech. Um, uh, um, Everything else. Yeah, every everything else. I couldn't think of the word for a second. Um, yeah. But has it ever delivered in the gaming space? And, and not really, right? Like, I know they've t tinkered around with it, but... Of course, to be fair, you know, we're n they're not there yet from a cost perspective. You know, the, yeah. the first... Sure, but they demoed it four years ago. That's true. So... Um, but as, a, as an interesting... Yeah, I, I, there's, there's certainly an argument to be made that, like, did that belong on an E3 stage versus, like, a CES sure, type yeah. of presentation, but... Um, it it was a neat thing to spark the imaginations of gamers at E3, right. and the thing we got to experience with Halo, um, you know, I talked so when you did turn the corner and went into that briefing room, and there was that little round table, little, uh, kind of like large action size figure sized Spartans appeared on the table, gave you the briefing, giving you the Warzone, briefing, yeah. and you could walk all around the table. And the, the perspective was exactly what it was supposed to be, as if it was really there. Mm -hmm. And it's that was really cool. It does. That was cool. so cool. Like, can you imagine playing Star Wars chess? Oh, oh. right, <laughs> exactly. Where the yeah. hologram comes up and you like move your pieces and the things pummel each other. Yeah. That is totally awesome. Well, I mean, even just something as simple like. A game like Beat Saber in VR, yeah, uh, yeah. something simple, movement oriented, could be awesome in augmented reality. Can you imagine just sitting on your couch wearing Hololens and playing Tetris? Like if you could reach out and just move the blocks with your hands and drop them down. Like yeah. I would have so much fun doing something like that. Like I think that, yeah, you're right. There's an argument to be made whether or not it should have been on an E3 stage, but it captured gamers' imaginations, and hopefully that still is a pillar for what they want HoloLens to be in the future. That's think, what I hope so, too. Know. I hope that gaming is considered a, a core tenant of that device, because yeah. uh, right now, I think they, they actually probably almost hurt themselves showing it uh, as far as gaming-related piece of tech, and then not really having anything to follow well, up with I it. Mean, Granted, that, it's not a consumer product. That's the thing. is like this announcement proves that they're not really thinking about that right now. Like mm -hmm. That's not the goal, and I think that's also fine. Like This doesn't I totally need to agree. be for us. Absolutely. Yeah. Just look at VR right now, right? Like It's very, very cool, but like it's still kind mm -hmm. Kind of trying to find its space here. It's super niche, right and now, yeah. it's like, wow, that was a cool experience that I, that I went and did at a friend's house. Now I don't really need one for myself. Like PSVR is is interesting, and I think um, there's like the vibe is great too, and like those are really great one-off experiences. But I think going further to develop gaming experiences that you want to send for a very long time for AR is its own challenge. And mm -hmm. especially if this equipment's so expensive, like how do you market that to everybody? Like there's all these different layers of this doesn't necessarily need to be for us right now. No, yeah. I, I, so to it's, I totally like agree. VR still is trying to find its thing. AR is like another thing yeah, entirely. Yeah, I agree. And I think that they get uh, intertwined too often. And I think yeah. that Microsoft probably, maybe probably got caught up in that sort of like VR arms race with yep. the PSVR becoming totally a agree. consumer facing product that you can own in your home. And Microsoft's like, well, we've got this we're working on as well. And you can play Minecraft on your coffee table, but you can't really. Yeah. yeah. And why would you really want to? Yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah, especially when such awesome here. things like the connector out there. I mean, it, it's the oh. history. History has kind hey, of. Hey, I still use my Kinect my. to navigate Netflix. History really? has uh, yeah. kind of vindicated Microsoft in the in their decision to, at least for the past and current foreseeable future, to sit out the the VR. I race. totally agree. I think you know because it was we know it was part of the Scorpio presentation. Yep. yep. VR. This thing can do VR. And then they, they, that was the last public word Microsoft has ever said about VR in a, in a, in a gaming Xbox context. But yeah, the market just has been slow to develop for, which is a whole conversation unto itself. But yeah, I mean, it's, uh, for, for people wondering, oh, you know, will the, will Anaconda and the Scarlet Generation bring VR? It doesn't seem like it right now. Yeah. You know? and, and that, that would almost seem like, not that it would be a connect level mistake, but I think Phil and, and the team are going to 
stay laser focused on the box and what gaming experiences that box and that box yeah. alone they have worked that's tailored yeah. specifically for gaming highest output for lowest cost possible and that's going to be it. I don't think they're I mean, going to distract themselves totally with anything else. It might have also been like extraordinarily wise to make that call early on to say to to look at potential like a potential business vertical like VR and assessing it and being like, you know, I don't know that that's going to pay off really well for us. Yeah. Uh, and then for them years later to kind of have been totally right about that because you're right, like VR. There's some cool games out there, Definitely. but like Miranda said, I don't think this is a must own for gamers. The it's people who do own it, right now. yeah, the people who do own it think like, hey, it's cool every once in a while here and there. Um, and but there isn't that killer app, and there isn't that like, oh, this is this is what the promise of VR right. is no. being fulfilled. There is yeah. a counter argument there that Microsoft should jump in because that would basically in, uh, encourage. All developers, because there's a PlayStation VR and an Xbox VR and the the Oculus and the the Vive, that would in, you know encourage more development. Maybe we'd finally get that killer app and end the chicken and egg game. I mean, there's Maybe. some like so, really great things in VR. The only I think there's this <coughs> problem though is that you can only be in VR for so long, right? right. Like you can't make. I mean, you could make a hundred hour experience. Like you can do Skyrim and stuff, but you need to take breaks. Like it's just a different right. sort of. Yeah. environment like it's weird right because like whenever you're developing a game you have to be aware of what space you're developing for like if you're developing an arcade game it's so different from developing a mm -hmm. console game and like that goes to say <coughs> the same for vr which is very obvious to say but i think there's these different limitations right now of like what like technology we have that's accessible um and that is you know feasible to develop for for those killer apps like right. what does that actually mean because there are really great cool things on in vr right now like even last year like one of our game of the year nominees was a vr game yes yeah. and so it's like th these exist it's just how do people get interest into getting them more widely when it's already technically accessible in its own way through PSVR, which is like the cheaper price point kind of thing. Right. And PC, which and everyone forgets that Microsoft has a vested interest there too, yeah. right? So like a large amount of the VR machines out there, I would reckon, are used on PC, right? Yeah. Like obviously PSVR by having a lower like price point has kind of carved itself out as like that a more consumer friendly the niche? most accessible, I would say. Yeah. Like, yeah. Even even for the PC models, though, like you look at it, and you have to have such a good PC to right. run these. That's mm -hmm. that's the problem. And like then also these very expensive units, and like getting into this is just tough. And like there's there's already like the mobile VR kits, like um, what's it called? Oh, uh, Google's, Google's um, dream. Yeah, cardboard yeah. thing. And yeah, yeah, like there's there's a lot of things out there. It's that's kind of why I don't think I think <laughs> this was wise for Microsoft to have not jumped in at least with Xbox specifically because they're like, listen, if that killer app comes, there's a good chance it'll come on PC. Which which, guess what? Everyone uses Windows on PC anyway, so we're kind of already winning there, yeah. right? And if, you know, we're not so, con at least I believe their thinking might be like, we're not so sure that the killer app's going to come through a game like P or a platform like PSVR. Yeah, I, I, I think Microsoft is really smart. Like, they didn't, they didn't get suckered into it. I think they started to with HoloLens and then pretty wisely realized that like the consumer facing uh, audience isn't what's driving the tech for this, uh, which is smart. But I think Microsoft is very smart for diversifying what they do. They have yes. an entertainment right. console. They have put the R&D into creating a streaming service with Project X Cloud. They have a subscription service now that is just generating revenue and is a great deal for consumers. Uh, and like you said, Phil Spencer even came out and said Windows 10 is not enough of a priority for us, and I want to rectify that. They have that PC market cornered as well. So uh, I don't think they need to get suckered into this sort of like head-to-head -head who can do the best PSVR thing or who can do the best VR experience. Well, oh yeah. It'll be interesting to see what the, you know, if, if HoloLens ends up having a future in the Xbox ecosystem at some point. Right. But for now, if you're really, really interested and you want to grab a HoloLens too... Uh, again, they're they're basically dev kits. They're uh, it's thirty five hundred dollars. Now that is that includes all the hardware. I mean, that's basically you a know, computer. No big deal. Yeah, no big. But thirty five hundred dollars, or they're they're trying to democratize it a little bit more. There is a subscription option, one hundred twenty five dollars per user per month. You could do it that way too. But just you know, just in case anybody out there says, "Hey, I want to see this," and I don't care what it costs, there you go. Uh, all right, we got to get moving here. Uh, let's do the loot box. We'll go around the table real quick. George from Kalamata, Greece. This gamer tag is George Khan, G George K O N 4002. Asks, 
which dead IPs, or let's call them dormant, let's be a little optimistic, dormant IPs <laughs> owned by Microsoft, for instance, Perfect Dark, Banjo, do you want to see as uh, resurrected on the Scarlet Generation? Just give me one. Everybody give me one. I mean, this guy took mine. I think Perfect Dark would be awesome. For Tell me years, why. For years, I've been... Okay, one reason. Because they have a sniper rifle that can look through walls? The far sight. The most <laughs> yeah. overpowered... You want to talk about... Actually, that's a great feature, too. Top 10 most overpowered guns. I think Where were these it. ideas while I, you still worked I think, here? I think that's already up. <laughs> Cerebral <laughs> Boar is on it. Okay, yeah. Far sight is on it. For those yeah. who didn't play Perfect Dark, it's a sniper rifle that can, not only allows the user to sh see through walls, but also shoot through walls. <laughs> so, Incredible. really OP. But I love that game. It's a great story. It's kind of like cyberpunky, very thriller. Uh, Joanna Dark like is Michael the main Jackson character. Thriller? No, it's just like the Go better ahead. version of Goldeneye. Like it is. Like wow. oh, okay. it is. Oh, damn. All right. Fact. Uh, I love okay. Goldeneye by the way. But go back and yeah. play that. It does not hold up. No, definitely. Well, <laughs> I mean. Uh, but Perfect Dark, it has this cool, like, cyberpunky aesthetic. It features a really awesome, like, more interesting character uh, as its protagonist. Uh, like, I remember it being one of those games that made me, that convinced me that shooters could work on console. This mm. is pre Halo, obviously. <laughs> and uh, I, I just think that that would be, I think that people very fondly remember that game. And if you were to reboot it and bring it back now and it's awesome and great looking, people would be like, oh, I remember that game. That's awesome. And I'd be stoked for it. So that's one I would want to see. Anybody else want to jump in with one? Oh, sorry. I know they're yelling at us for like slamming on the desk. Sorry. Um, I'm very excited. Fusion <laughs> Frenzy. Oh, my God. I know, what a I great... Keep, <laughs> I keep bringing it back. And it's like one of my favorite experiences from the original Xbox. So much and fun. Give me remastered games. Give me new games that like make best use of this tech. You know, like all those like shiny car games are like, we're launching. Look at look at our graphics. No, give me that in a mini game. <laughs> I don't know. Like It's very goofy. But I just love good party games that have like a focus on... Just exciting mini games that challenge you in different ways. Like Fusion Frenzy had rhythm games, it had like racing games, mm -hmm. it had so many good and and a, and a, a console launch as George yeah. was asking about is sort of the perfect it's, time for a party game, right? Yes. Something that four people, four more people in the same room can play on this mm -hmm. new expensive thing you just bought. Do you remember that mini game in that where it's like you're running up the side of a screw essentially and yep. you have yes. to duck or jump under the bars yes. and stuff? Yep. Like people are like, oh, that sounds so easy, no, but it is not. It Once gets it gets so going really fast, oh, yeah. it's and great, man. There's all these other games where you got you to protect your burger because all these little bugs are coming. You got to yeah. kill them. Or you're on this circular platform and you all roll in in balls and like try and hamster wheel yeah, and knock that's them That's the one I like, remember. Yeah. Oh, it's really well, so much I'm going to go with uh, another Another rare IP. I I got a soft spot in my heart for Conquer. Conquer oh, yeah. is oh, bad okay. for a day. So the the original Xbox remake of the N sixty four game with with that fur shading that they did, like that was one of the most artistically beautiful yeah. original Xbox that games. Like it was looked incredible. It, at the time, it looked stunning. Yeah. Uh, what was that? Conquer's bad for a day. Reloaded. Is that it, what was it was Conquer Live and Reloaded. Live was and the reloaded. name of the the remake. And and this the single player campaign it was still a really fun you know just raunchy, tongue in cheek platformer with poop monsters and all kinds <laughs> of. Puzzles. I would love to see a new a next generation like 4K fur shaded, <laughs> stunningly gorgeous. Uh, give me yeah. give me a new conquer. I would I would love I could to see, see that. that. I could see that. Like at the E3 presentation, he just like takes a cigar out of his mouth. He's like, I'm back. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to see it. Uh, yeah, I don't. I, I mean, Fable. <laughs> mm. uh, I know it's. Not dead. It's it's there. Are, there, are, there are rumors and 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 talks about it coming back. But I think back to the first trailer I ever saw for Fable, and it was that fairy tale music, and there were and the the announcer, uh, just the generic old man voice was like, "Welcome to the world of Albion." Yeah, mm -hmm. and I was like, "Yep, I'm in, hundred percent." Yeah, I'll play that RPG fairy tale. And and Microsoft has never had a lot of like exclusive Western RPGs. Um, they had uh, was it Lost Odyssey, and then they had Blue right. Blue Dragon. I yep. think. Well, those came out of the East. Yeah, yeah definitely not. That's, West that's what I'm saying. Either, is like yeah. they had JRPG exclusives. Yeah. Uh, they never really had Western RPG exclusives. So I I really miss like a Kotor. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Only the best role playing game ever made. I, I, also, I, fine. Mass Effect Fantasy. was an exclusive. That's true. Yeah. Yes, First was, one was. Yeah. 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 Um, but then I also think of like Mech Assault, which was super fun yes. back in the day. I actually had that written down. I was like, give me more Mech Assault. Yeah, Mech Assault oh, was the first. Awesome, yeah. uh, do you guys remember the Xbox Live disc to get started? Yes. 
It had you. the guy who was like, and I can talk like death, or I can talk like a robot. And yeah. <laughs> it was so, so cam- like hammy. It was perfect. But I remember watching that and then jumping into Mechasol and thinking like, holy crap, this is the future. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I was 100% sold. So like, give me Not another love for mechs. Give me another console mech game, please. That's all about that. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't go with Fable because we already effectively know that Playgrounds. Do we? Doing, <laughs> I sure hope so. Because yeah, me too. If those rumors somehow prove to be untrue, I'm gonna be. Uh, I'm gonna be one of many very disappointed Xbox gamers. But good stuff, George. Thank you for that question. If you want to ask us something in the loot box, just email me anytime. Email us unlocked at ign.com is the uh, place you can send your question. It's also the place you can send your unlock block trivia question. Four multiple choice answers. Note the correct one in your email. This week's comes to us from BK. Uh, his gamer tag is Brian30, B R Y O N, if you want to friend him. And this is a good one. I, I don't remember this, and so I would not have gotten this correct. So he's, uh, Brian stumped me on this one. What 19, I know this predates Xbox, but just, let's just roll with it. What 1999 EA sports game on uh, PlayStation was pulled from shelves for having. It's the South Park Jesus versus Santa short that made its way around the internet that that led to South Park being yeah, it was the, given its full series. The pilot. For yes. The show, essentially. Uh, it had the Jesus versus Santa South Park short buried on one of the root folders on the disc. It shipped on the, the disc. Uh, you could only get to it by putting that PlayStation disc in a PC and opening up a certain folder. But it did result yeah. in a, the first 100,000 copies of this game being recalled. So was it Madden that year, NBA Live, Tiger Woods, or Champion Bass, which is fishing. So I literally have no idea, yeah. but I have some crazy roundabout logic to justify what I'm going to choose, okay. which is Champion Bass. I'm sure that's a made-up name, so <laughs> that can't be it. Tiger Woods PGA Tour. This is 1999. Tiger Woods wasn't big back then, so that's not it either. So I'm going to have to go with A, Madden. Brandon, I'm give me a with- guess. I'm going to go with, I believe Champion Bass is actually a, <laughs> a real game, but game. <laughs> I, I'm going to go with C, Tiger Woods PGA Tour, um, for no other reason other than I know that series has some kooky stuff in it, like you can find Bigfoot in one of the holes and Whoa. stuff like that, so uh, yeah, I'm going to go with Tiger Woods. I have no idea either, Yeah. so I'm guessing. Miranda? I really like to think that the fishing game is weird. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't think it really is it, but I want to believe, but also I'm just like, would it sell that much that fast? I actually oh, don't true. know what like this time yeah. span was it for it. So, um, against me being goofy, I, I want to go with D, but I'll just go with B to B. Go with that B a lot. Okay. No one's no one's betting on the bass. I want huh? I want to bet on the fishing, but <laughs> uh, I'm Tiger Woods was oh. the game. yeah. It snuck onto a, the copies of Tiger Woods. Okay. Well, a lot like my older appearances on Unlocked, I never get these right. <laughs> I'm uh, inheriting that. <laughs> Really? I'm so bad at trivia. Yeah, at the end of like, I don't know, 2015 or 2016 when I was regularly on this show, I had like maybe one or two points. <laughs> Destin had like 15 or 16. Alana had 12. I felt bad. Well, no but you can't hold it against bad. me. Yeah, no yeah. need to feel bad. Good Actually, job, Brandon. Thanks. Actually, people on Twitter have been asking me uh, to bring the trophy back on Unlocked. So maybe for uh, after the announcement at the end of the show, maybe next episode. Oh, yeah. We'll just grab all the trophies and put them on the desk. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, that is uh, that is Unlock Block Trivia for this week. Again, I told you how, and I encourage you to participate. Send in your Xbox trivia questions. We'd love to hear from them. So uh, before we go, yeah, quick programming note. So uh, Unlocked is going to be moving back to just being an audio-only podcast. So we're just going to – it's going to be – you're still going to get it. You're still going to get it uh, – you we'll see what the if the timing will change at all other than the – you know, the video thing we'd put out on Tuesday afternoons and then podcast would go up on Wednesday afternoon. Um, hey, we, we did the video. We tried the video thing for a while. And honestly, it's it, there is a ton of work that you don't see behind the camera that goes into making this a video show in addition to a podcast. And uh, we've decided here we're going to we're going to be piloting some new stuff. And so wanted to we're going to clear the sort of clear the way bandwidth wise. So uh, Unlocked will return to its roots as an audio-only podcast. Uh, so we got one more that we'll also put on a video. That's next week. So basically starting, well, next week's March. So uh, in March, we'll, we'll be moving uh, to audio-only. I'll fill you in on the, the 
any logistical details as far as if the, the time of the show publish will change, but I want to kind of take it and put some of the little musical bumpery things back in to make it more of an audio listening experience like it like it used to be. But yeah, effectively, I think for most people, it just that won't it won't change at all. Most of you do listen to it as an audio podcast, but wanted to give you the heads up. Uh, I will mention though, if you just like consuming it on YouTube and you use you've got YouTube open all day, the show will still be there. We're just going to uh, syndicate that just the audio will just push to the unlocked YouTube channel. There just won't be video. It'll just be a logo. It'll just be our logo and then the audio running there. So you'll still be able to find it on YouTube just uh, without our moving bodies and faces and mouths. Without the moving pictures. Exactly. <laughs> so Can we get a uh, morning radio soundboard? For the, uh, the oh podcast. my god, that I would like be that so great! <laughs> <laughs> just Negative go infinity. full morning zoo like with it. it. <laughs> just the, a button. <laughs> uh, that'd be great. Anyway, there's that. Uh, I'm Ryan McCaffrey. You can find me on Twitter at dmc underscore ryan. I gave my plug earlier. Please check out IGN Unfiltered. It could not be more up an Xbox fans alley this month with Bonnie Ross. Uh, there's also 38 other. I- interviews there if you've never looked at it or haven't looked at it in a while with all kinds of amazing people from across the games industry so please take a look at ign unfiltered i'd be grateful uh i'll save sean for last yep. uh brandon I'm, I'm brandon you can find me on twitter at just my name brandon tyrell and uh yeah definitely go check out that unfiltered with bonnie ross and sean i know i speak for everybody when i say that you always have an in interesting perspective uh to bring to everything so we are we are definitely gonna miss you thank you very much thank you um sorry i'm interrupted no, oh, okay. sorry no do i go next yeah you want, yeah we'll, you see, you go we'll save we'll save the 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 you're not the birthday <laughs> boy it's like no. it's like i guess you're the funeral boy <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. wow well, 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 hey, according to mark, if you're not here anymore you're dead so. <laughs> according to who mark mark medina oh. <laughs> you, I, did you miss it um yeah, we also probably. missed the bam at the earlier so Bam. Oh, that's nice. My, that's my best. Nicely done. Nice. Um, you can follow me at Havoc Rose, and that's Havoc with K on Instagram and Twitter. Um, right now, I am working on a feature about, I almost said Mass Effect in Draw, but I'm like, no, it's Anthem. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the other <laughs> About game. Anthem and uh, what I like about some of the NPCs and collectibles since I'm mm. also working on the guide. Um, speaking of which, I am working on the guide, and we have like a nice guide going for Anthem, so if you guys have questions regarding that. We got some stuff going. Excellent. Yeah. Um, also, has still rolling with that Apex Legends guide. Um, that's kind of a lot of what I've been working on right so now. So that's a lot of work right some, there between some other those projects. Features, yeah. Just a lot of things. I got my first legendary last night. Ooh. Nice. Sean Finnegan, uh, the Shark Man. It's me. Uh, Take us home. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Shop by Finnegan. Like I said, I'm really grateful to Ryan and to Brandon and to. Uh, Miranda and to Destin and to all of the unlocked crew that have you know uh, that I've had the opportunity to talk with over the years. Uh, seven years at IGN coming to a close here that's in the last time, like man. week or so. So that's like your entire adult professional life. Honestly, I was gonna say it's really hard to move on because I basically grew up here, and yeah. over the years I've made so many incredible videos and films, and some of it is the best work I've ever made, and I will always bleed IGN's red and white because of that. Uh, so even if I'm going off, like I'll still be around and I really want to thank all of you and the fans for supporting the show and for supporting everything we do here because this community really is one of the best out there and I can't underscore that more. So uh, thank you all for having me. I'm just really, like it's really quite an honor to be able to share the table with such amazing experts and journalists. So mm-hmm. thank you for everything you do and I'll continue to watch everything IGN makes going forward. Um, and I definitely will try not to be a stranger. And uh, since you're leaving, you you can't get yelled at anymore for banging your hands on the table. Oh yeah, sorry. Which apparently, makes very for animated. A terrible people, audio listening experience. People so, at home have probably muted this. Oh my gosh. Oh sorry. Yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you why. I used to produce Unlocked, right? And so I know what it sounds like back there. But the reason we have these coasters underneath our little mic stands is yeah, because the, the mic stand team. tap on it, and it reverberates throughout the whole desk and the mic stand, and it creates this really loud sound. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I was just yeah. Wherever. <laughs> Really passionate. Yeah, yeah I like to uh, get, I move around a lot when I'm expressing things that are very you hard. You do the yeah. Bill Clinton fist in the thumb, and yeah. that's how you show exactly. your passion. I did not have uh, <laughs> I did. Halo relations with that, <laughs> okay. with that game. 
Hey, uh, well. <laughs> anyway. Boy, that feels like just the innocence of yesteryear at this point, doesn't oh it? Oh, my God, yeah. Um, anyway, context. yeah, hopefully our new, wherever we record moving forward, just won't have this desk. Right. Just something that's... Something different. You know, just like a desk that's topped with soundproofing so you can smack it all you want and nothing mm-hmm. happens mm-hmm. anyway so no, uh, therapy table sean uh <laughs> it's been a it's been a pleasure yeah you hey, look, sean. i didn't even i mentioned unlock 201 but my other personal favorite project that you so beautifully shot was when i uh reviewed the the tesla yes years ago like before i even started my tesla podcast yeah we we convinced tesla to let us to let ign a because we we had a I mean, we we have tech now, but we we had a kind of a renewed focus on tech then, and they gave us a car for like three days, and we we filmed the heck out of it and did all kinds of neat stuff. It was amazing, it was and so that's when I fell in love with Tesla, <laughs> and also working with you. Like I said, Ryan, you're the goat, man. You're amazing, and Brandon, I remember working with you like for the very first time yeah. at some event where I got super sick. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. God. We went to some event where like uh, we, it was a preview event for some yeah. game that I forget now, and I showed up there with Brandon, who was freelancing for us at the time, and I got the worst headache and was oh literally just laying down outside on yeah. the floor. Oh. Actually, yes, that was <laughs> EA. Uh, we, I think it was. Oh man, it might have been a Battlefield or yeah, something. Battlefield. But I remember that's actually because I was freelancing for IGN, but I had applied for yes. an associate editor position. I remember, and I remember after the event was over, we were sitting at the table, and you were just like, "Hang in there, man. Good things will happen." And I was like, "Oh." And then we hired sweet. you, and that was and then I got hired four years ago, and you've done incredible work since. It's a long time awesome. ago. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, Miranda, like we don't get to work too closely together, but we made an awesome episode of Fast Travel. Yeah, and you were always so sweet, and I want to see you talk about anime all. Thanks. All the time. Fantastic. Sean, uh, we wish you the best. We'll be eager to see uh, where your next stop is. I look yeah. forward to finding that out. Don't be a stranger. Stop by any time. Follow the Shark Man on Twitter because uh, Halo oh. Infinite will be around before you know it, and you're going to want to know that what this guy thinks of it. Absolutely. I will not be going too far. You will always be able to find my opinions and content out there very soon. All right. For Miranda Sanchez, Brandon Tyrell, Uh, Destin Legary is on assignment. I'm Ryan McCaffrey. And for the great Sharkman, Sean Finnegan, this was Unlock 383. We'll see you back here next week.